How's everyone doing? It's Isaac Way, Doctor of Pharmacy, and today I'm in a great mood because we're going to be talking about one of my favorite molecules of all time. This is sertraline, which is also known as Zoloft, and it's incredibly popular for good reason. It's effective at treating a wide range of conditions, including depression, anxiety, and obsessive compulsive disorder. And as a modern antidepressant, it's got a really solid safety profile, as it's not addictive and pretty difficult to overdose on. However, it's not all rainbows and sunshine, and there are a few key things you should know about sertraline before starting this antidepressant. First of all, let's talk about how sertraline works. Now, sertraline is a type of antidepressant called a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. What this means is that it increases the action of the feel-good brain chemical serotonin, and it does this by preventing serotonin from being reabsorbed from the space between neurons, which is called the synapse, back into the presynaptic neuron, which is the neuron that shot out the serotonin in the first place. This means that serotonin has more time to float around in that synapse and activate that postsynaptic neuron, leading to more serotonergic signaling and improved mood over time. However, improved mood doesn't happen right away and often can take between 4 to 12 weeks to kick in. For depression, benefits can often be seen earlier and for anxiety, it often takes a little bit longer to start working. Other conditions where serotonin is effective include post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, eating disorders, social anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and a whole bunch of other ones as well. Now, from your comments, I know that there is a lot of controversy about whether or not antidepressants like sertraline are actually effective. And right now, I'm happy to say that the scientific consensus is that while antidepressants are no magic pill and might not work as well as we originally thought, they are definitely better than placebo, also known as a sugar pill. And given that sertraline tends to be very well tolerated with mild and temporary side effects, many patients will benefit from taking this drugs and it can be really life-changing and maybe even save some lives as well. Now, when it comes to how effective sertraline is compared to other antidepressants in treating depression, it seems to rank in the middle of the pack according to a large network meta-analysis and one of my all-time favorite studies. Now that we've talked about efficacy, let's move on to safety, because just like any other drug, sertraline can sometimes cause side effects. Some of the most common include drowsiness, dizziness, sexual dysfunction, insomnia, dry mouth sweating, indigestion. Sertraline also tends to cause a lot of gastrointestinal issues, such as upset stomach, nausea, and diarrhea. And for that reason, it's always recommended to take sertraline with food. Now, most of these side effects do go away with time as your body gets used to the drug, and these side effects can really be minimized by starting at a low dose of sertraline, such as 25 milligrams, and increasing slowly over time. Now, one common side effect is sexual dysfunction, particularly decreased libido, erectile dysfunction, and trouble achieving orgasm. Sexual dysfunction can be reduced, thankfully, by either decreasing the dose, switching to a different antidepressant, or adding on another antidepressant like bupropion. A very rare but severe side effect is suicidal ideation, and this tends to be more common among young adults and teenagers. And for this reason, if you fall into that category or one of your loved ones is on the younger side, it's really important to keep them monitored at least for the first few weeks of therapy. Now, like most other antidepressants, coming off of sertraline can be a hassle as it can sometimes lead to a discontinuation syndrome. You might feel sad, anxious, nauseous, irritable, and have trouble sleeping. Now, thankfully, the discontinuation syndrome is not dangerous and can be reduced by slowly decreasing your dosage over a few weeks. And if your symptoms are especially bad, you can always simply resume taking sertraline and they should go away. Now, as bad as these side effects sound, it's really important to note that most people do very well with sertraline. And as an SSRI, sertraline is much safer than older generations of antidepressants, such as tricyclic antidepressants, which have a tendency to cause heart toxicity at high dosages, and monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which tend to have a lot of serious drug, drug, and drug food interactions. And when we compare sertraline to other common antidepressants, in terms of side effects, um, at least when it comes to people that were treated for depression, 
Again, it seems to rank in the middle of the pack. And this is again for my all time favorite study. Now that we've talked about side effects, let's move on to drug drug interactions. Now, first of all, just like other SSRIs, it's not recommended to take sertraline with alcohol, cannabis, or other sedating drugs, as these drugs can increase the risk for psychomotor impairments, such as difficulty concentrating, walking in a straight line, and slurred speech, and definitely don't drive if you're gonna be mixing these ones together. Sertraline also interacts with stimulants and other types of antidepressants, which can sometimes lead to a serotonin syndrome, which is a life-threatening condition characterized by having too much serotonin, and sertraline also interacts with NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which are basically your common painkillers like ibuprofen and naproxen, but not Tylenol. Tylenol is not an NSAID. Anyways, this interaction can increase the risk of bleeding as both types of drugs mess with your platelets. Now let's talk about cost and coverage. And when it comes to cost and coverage, sertraline is simply fantastic. Now as an older molecule, cheaper generics are available, which are typically inexpensive and covered by most insurance plans. Now people have asked me before about my stance on generic drugs versus brand name. Is there a difference between the two drugs? Should I uh, pay more money for the, for the brand name or is the generic gonna be an okay substitute? And I'm happy to say that I am in favor of generic drugs. I personally take generic drugs. I recommend generic drugs to all of my patients, family members and friends. And if you're in a country with good drug regulators like Canada or the States, the regulators make sure that the generic drugs have a similar pharmacokinetic profile, almost identical to the brand name product. What this basically means is that the amount of drug in your bloodstream over time is gonna be the same, whether or not you took the generic drug or if you took the brand name product. And I'm of the opinion that if the pharmacokinetic profiles of the active ingredients in two products are the same, the products are essentially identical. Anyways, that's all I have to talk to you about today. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you found value in this video and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks again and I'll see you in the next video.